Welcome to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Every week, I'll be sitting down with a sales executive where they'll share their stories and experiences that produce game-changing results. Let's be honest, sales can be a tough game. I'm sure at some point, we've all delivered a less than stellar demo, been ghosted by a client or two, and sometimes, maybe we did more talking than listening. And that's where I can help. The stories and insights our guests share can be applied to your own business, your territory, or with your team, so you're not reinventing the wheel. Our weekly tactics and strategies help you get out of your head and start creating your own path towards game-changing results. Welcome back to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. The goal of this show is to share game-changing stories that our guests have experienced with themselves, their team, or what they're seeing in the industry. And the focus of today is, is one that's near and dear to my heart, because I can tell you firsthand, I know what it's like to be the only woman in the room, sometimes the only woman on the team or in a panel. So I'm excited to have a conversation on what it's going to take to close the gender gap in B2B sales and to adopt a culture of diversity and inclusion. And to have this conversation as someone who's very well equipped uh, with 30 years of sales experience a CEO and founder of Women's Impact Network, and most recently, Girls Who Sell, a published author of Upward, and her purpose is to close the gender gap in B2B sales, to make a difference, affect change, and lead the world in a better place for the generation behind her. And I'm excited to have Heidi Solomon Orlick join us today. Heidi, welcome to the podcast. Karen, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here, and I appreciate you inviting me. My pleasure. Well, I think, as, as I said, this is something near and dear uh, to my heart. And when I shared your purpose, I, I don't know any male or female that wouldn't agree with it and wouldn't want to support, you know, closing that gender gap, because it's something that we've, we've talked about it for a long time. And I think 2021, I'm excited to hear about what we're doing in form of action to really move the needle. Um, so in saying that, why don't you start and give us a little bit of background about um, your, your newly launched business, Girls Who Sell? I started my career out of college in um, advertising and marketing in the early 80s. Uh, so if you can imagine, if you think sales is a, a male-dominated industry now, um, I can assure you that it was uh, even more male-dominated back then. And, you know, I have spent my career, uh, you know, kind of clawing my way uh, to the top and, and uh, you know, leadership positions and have always been focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, even before it was popular or a box uh, to check amongst companies, because um, I wasn't a person that had um, a lot of, um, or any uh, female mentors as I was um, you know, working my way up the ranks of my career. Um, my, uh, and so it was really important to me uh, to try to help and impact and train and mentor and sponsor other young talent along the way. But I had always done it within the context of the companies that I work for. Um, and after the death of my, uh, both of my parents in 2019, I, I, I was going through a very transformational time in my life and I was very focused on purpose and I was giving a lot of thought around, you know, all right, I've spent 30 years in, in B2B sales. I've been blessed with having an incredible, incredibly successful career. How do I marry my passion for uh, sales and for mentoring young emerging talent so that I can make an impact and, and you know, influence future generations. And so on a Sunday afternoon, I was reading a Harvard Business Review article on, uh, you know, entitled Women Are the Future of B2B Sales. And uh, first of all, it struck me as wait, we're not the future. <laughs> you know, we, you know, we're here, we're now. Um, and by the end of the day, I had done some research about the, you know, the, the gaps that 
the gender gaps that existed and was really passionate. I was like, oh my gosh, this is my calling. This is it. This is what I was meant to do in my life. And by the end of the day, Girls Who Sell was born. And to, to your point, what really what we're focused on is, um, you know, our mission is to not only to get more women in sales, right, in enterprise sales, but uh, there's a lot of fabulous work that's being done for women that are already in, in, in sales um, or have chosen sales as a career option. Uh, so that space was pretty crowded. And so what I wanted to do was really get younger and uh, to, to one, position sales as an intentional career choice for women, uh, for young women, so college-aged, high school-aged, and then also um, to create the largest pipeline of early-stage diverse talent. And the most recent stats I have is in 2019. But in 2019, 15.8 million people uh, worked in a sales capacity, all right? Now that's across all sales types of, of jobs, right? Business to business, as well as business to consumer. It is actually, sales is actually the largest single employment category in the US, you can imagine. Of that, two to three million people, individuals are involved in B2B sales across all levels. And only 35% of that um, two to three million are women. Once you start overlaying women in leadership, it drops down to 19%. Once you start overlaying different industries like technology sales, it drops down to 12%. And once you start overlaying any kind of diversity metric, like women of color, as an example, or other diverse communities, the numbers are just dismal. They're just single digits. But what's also interesting is that when you look at the statistics, women are actually better than their male counterparts in, in sales. So if you look overall um, at the stats, women are, I'll just throw out a couple of stats, 5% more likely to close the deal and, 11, and have 11% higher um, um, you know, close rate, as an example. We're more, we have a higher propensity of, of moving deals through, um, through the pipeline, you know, through the different stages of, of the pipeline. So women, women are, are better at it um, than their male counterparts. And I think a lot of that comes because we do have the innate personality traits to be successful in sales. And I think sales is based on authenticity, success in sales is based on authenticity, it's based on, on being to, able to establish trust, uh, having attention to detail, being able to build relationships, being able to solve problems and create solutions that can impact um, and solve for business problems. And that's just women just do that naturally. And so we need to get more women in sales. That's what we need to do. So I, I love what you're saying on um, the intentionality, and, and I kind of want to go there first. Um, but before I do there, though, some of those stats that, you know, 35% of women in sales, and, you know, that's just unacceptable in, in 2021. So I really want to break down throughout our conversation, you know, what's contributing to that? How can we make a difference, you know, both on the, on the sales person as also the companies to really support the change? But before we go there, you know, just back to what you say, you know, when I talk to guests on the podcast or even some of my customers and myself included, you know, when you ask people, well, how did you get into sales? And rarely have I ever heard, well, you know, it was intentional. I sought out after it was something I really wanted to do. And it's a fallback. You know, we end up in it or, you know, it just works out that way. But it's we, we end up in sales by accident. And I, I'm curious to your thoughts as to how can we make it more intentional? Like, and part of it, I'm thinking maybe as I'm saying this is, you know, schools, like if you're, if your target audience is at that college university, you know, for me, it was like, what's my major, what I'm going to do after. And if sales was in that, I might have, you know, entertained it at that point. Because again, you think about the 22 year olds, what are they interested in? They're interested in money. You know, they're coming out of school with debt, but, but it's an exciting job at that young age, but it was never on the radar. 
So I'm just curious, Heidi, what are your thoughts in some ways that, you know, we can make it more intentional? You know, what can companies do that can start really elevating sales and seeing it as a profession that people are going to go after? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would I would say that, uh, you know, if you ask a young girl, you know, what you want to be when you grow up, uh, no young girl ever said that I want to be in B2B sales. <laughs> so um, hopefully we can we can change and and influence that. But I think overall, uh, the sales profession has been very male dominated and in the interviews that I've done with a lot of young women or even women that already, you know, are in sales, fell into sales or in, are in sales leadership, it, uh, you know, they had a very negative perception of and misunderstanding of what sales is. And I think it, there's this still this thought of, you know, it's kind of the snake oil salesman or, you know, it's sleazy or, you know, the back room, uh, you know, conversations that are happen happening in the used car dealerships. Right. And, um, and, and actually I think it's really important to be able to dispel those misconceptions once in, and for all, because particularly B2B sales, uh, requires it. It's a it's a difficult job. It is not a an easy job, but it's actually one of the. It's one of the only professions where you can actually influence and create impact for companies that you don't even work for, right? You can you can focus on solving business problems. The other interesting thing I think about sales is that um, when you look at when you when you look at uh, the C the C suite right of women who are in the C suite or at women who are successful entrepreneurs, um, you know, while finance is actually the largest um, like area that, you know, where uh, C-suite executives um, come from or, or career path through, sales is actually second. And, um, for it, and about 20% of women who are C-level executives today came from um, a sales background. So I think, I think we need to, I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of misperception. The other interesting uh, thing that I, that I think that we need to start looking at, Karen, as a, just as companies, is, is the way sales positions are actually advertised and marketing, marketed. Because, um, I had a really interesting conversation with a PhD candidate who is focusing on women in sales. And uh, she was, they completed an analysis and they were looking at the language that was utilized in recruiting advertising for sales positions. And it was really male, you know, oriented. Right. So focused on, oh, you get, you know, you can, you know, kick butt and you can kill it and generate, <laughs> you know, and, and it's competitive and, you know, all of the things that you would, you know, think about, you know, that would be appealing to a man versus you get to, you know, solve problems. You get to work as a part of a team. You get to actually um, influence decisions. You can have financial independence. There's, you know, there's a lot of different career options and that you can go into. So starting in, in, you know, early stage in a sales career, there's, there's a lot of options and, and places that you can go within a corporation up into the C-suite as, you know, the stats show, um, if you start in sales. And so I think why women are doing it, I think there's negative, still a very negative perception. I think colleges um, and universities are not 
um, they're perpetuating that negativity and they don't put value on sales as a profession. Um, that's starting to change a little bit. A lot of colleges, you know, not a lot, but some colleges today are um, starting to incorporate sales either as a major or as a minor under, let's say, a marketing degree um, or something like that. But it hasn't been a, a career or a, a, an option for people to choose, you know, as they've gone through, you know, gone through, gone to college. Yeah. Those are all great points, Heidi. And I think one of them you, you started with was dispelling the myth and that negative connotation. And I think dispelling it by words is one thing, but, but I think what's lacking is we, we need to show it. We need to demonstrate that we are authentic people genuinely trying to help because otherwise that snake oil used car salesman, that's still holding, you know, rank. And you just think, out of all the professions, we always have had a negative experience in some form, but you know, you let, you let it go and then it's not so bad, but for some reason, sales still has that. And, and I think part of it is because I still see there are still a lot of, you know, people that are, are doing it for the, the wrong reasons. And that comes across. And especially in times like now, when the buyer behavior is so different and they're just less tolerant with all that. So I agree with dispelling the myth. And just to cap onto what you were saying about intentionality, um, I think language is very key. And, and just as you mentioned, you know, you know, hunter and crushing goals and all these things, like, I mean, think what they mean. They mean results oriented. They mean, you know, performance based, but th that language does not attract um, a woman and it, and it doesn't. And, and I think even the language in the word sales. So I coach a female entrepreneur group. And as soon as I get into the sales coaching piece, immediately they start with, but I don't sell. I, I can't sell it and I don't sell. So I think that the word sales has gives them a physical reaction. And I think, well, you have to convince, you know, you have to convince your kid to, you know, to brush their teeth or you have to convince your partner. So that's still selling in, in some way you're connecting and you're persuading. So just the word selling itself, people get a, oh, I can't do it. Right. And so I think language is very important. And one other thing is, you know, when you're saying, how can we attract them in the language? And I would agree with that. But even when they're already in there, how do we keep them and, and really keep this culture of, of females? And I can tell you, you know, being in, in sales for 20 years, um, even when you're having group activities, like a lot of them are male, they're geared towards males. So right away, if you're having a sales meeting and, you know, half of them are playing hockey and half of them are doing yoga, you know, there's your group culture divided in two. So language plays a role, but also can you drive inclusivity in the activities you're doing in the, you know, collaborative experience you're creating with your team so that you're bringing people together and getting that, that cross thought, cross pollination happening without further dividing them. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? I can't tell you the number of sales meetings that I've been through that the activity is golf right and guess what i don't play golf and i mean i i totally suck at it and uh and never really wanted to learn um to be honest to to my dad's chagrin because he was a you know a, a scratch golfer and i think he always had visions of you know father daughter golf tournaments i was a competitive athlete i i rode horses um and and evented but um, but golf was not my thing. And so I would go to these things and I would feel completely isolated and, and still do and try to, you know, I, I actually brought that yeah. to, to the management and they were like, oh, okay, well, you know, we'll do like a spa thing. You can choose like a spa thing or golf. And, um, you know, I do think that we need to make the environment more uh, collaborative um, in terms of, of those, um, those activities for sure, for sure. Right. It's a, it's a, it's definitely an issue. Yeah. And, and just what you said, when you would bring that to the management and say, you know, I'm not a golfer, 
and they would give you a spa. Like for me right away, that's a self-awareness. Like when they're, when they're designing these activities, have they not considered that not everybody's a golfer or if they had chosen spa, that it may not like, where's that common denominator that can, that can appease everybody and bring us all together. So for me, that makes me think like the leadership on that culture is not one of, uh, of diversity and inclusivity. If they're thinking already in, if you have to remind them that then that's a red flag for me just having awareness. And I think education is, is so, so key. Well, if you, if you had, for me, think about the management and if you had females, if you had a blended leadership team and and you're planning these meetings, it's going to have a different outcome. Right. And I think that's also a trouble, a problem is that there's not enough, as you mentioned the stats, you know, there's no, there's, there's not as many female leaders at the top as there should be. So when you're attracting talent and you're in the interview phase and I walk in and I see three men, I don't see myself in this picture. You're trying to find, you know, what what one of these looks like me or or how can I uh, fit in here? So it's very hard to be relatable, even in that entry level. And, you know, I, I, again, I was just surrounded by men. So that's all I knew. I, I didn't kind of know any different until I started seeing women. I'm like, oh, I guess I am the only one here, but it's, you don't know what you don't know. I, I agree with that. And it's interesting because some of the male, you know, the the companies that I've worked for that have had women uh, in leadership positions approach things very differently than that. <laughs> Golf was definitely not on the radar. It was, you know, yeah. let's uh, let's do a you know collaborative experience where. Uh, you know, team building exercise where, you know, we're building, you know, we, we create cross-functional, cross-gender teams to, you know, anything from building bikes to do rope courses, to doing trust exercises to, you know, and that's what I've seen um, in, in more of those, um, you know, women-led type of organizations is it's definitely more uh, female female oriented. But I think I, I agree with you that there is a not only an issue with the recruiting advertising. So I mean when you think about it, that is driven through the eight the human resources and recruiting departments. Um, so they're already predisposing the candidates, you know, the candidate pool of who's going to be applying to those ads. And then when you come in, even as a woman, if you muster up the competence, uh, to apply for one of these positions, if you're going through a interview process that is predominantly or 100% male oriented, it can be very intimidating, right? So I think that it is it it is incumbent upon organizations, and this applies not only to hiring and women in sales, frankly, but I think it applies to hiring for any diverse position, um, that there has to be bias training, there there needs to be sensitivity training, because, you know, pe- people tend to uh, default to their comfort zone, which is, I'm going to hire somebody that looks just like me and thinks just like me. And we all know the stats that, you know, bringing in diverse candidates uh, impacts exponentially um, the success of a business. And so I think that there needs to be, like I had a conversation, you know, with a a company, uh, an organization um, called College Code. And it's really an amazing uh, really an amazing uh, company. And they're doing a lot of work at the college level and they're very focused on diversity and inclusion initiatives. And so we're partnering with them. Um, Girls Who Sell is partnering with them. And one of the things that we were talking about is it's it's okay building the pipeline of future early stage and diverse female sales talent. But unless we fix <laughs> what's happening at the corporate level, so for everything from the way candidates are sourced and then the recruiting process and then how diversity and inclusion initiatives are addressed internally, 
creating safe spaces, creating uh, support and career pathing for women. Unless we fix that, then building the pipeline is 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 it's only one piece of the puzzle. It's not going to solve the problem because if we're building a pipeline mm-hmm. and companies yeah. aren't affecting change or making you know, changes in the way that they do business and creating programs that are more supportive of women, then they're going to leave, then women are going to leave. No, it's got to be at that foundational level. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's got to be at the foundational level where they're making those changes. And I think a lot of times in those initial interviewing stages, companies are using AI to sift through those and AI is not perfect. And some of those biases are not coming up, right? So I think it's very important to, uh, to really have um, you know, some human um, filtering as well of, of what's going on there. Um, you also said, you know, being the only woman sometimes in the room and things like that. And, and I just think when you're the only something, imagine the pressure you're putting on yourself because you feel, you feel all these eyes around you and you think you're probably going to, you know, put in double work, double effort. And, and, and I think, you know, thinking about now, you know, we're already burnt out. But if you're the only woman on the team or the department, you're adding this additional pre- pressure. So what are you seeing, if anything, in terms of how is that contributing to burnout, like on t- in a pandemic versus, you know, the traditional ways? No, I think it's, I, 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 listen, I think women are under a tremendous amount of stress right now. I mean, clearly the uh, impact of the pandemic has not been general, gender neutral. Uh, and uh, you know, more women, I think over a million more women have lost jobs and been impacted over, you know, versus their male counter counterparts. And I don't have the exact data here, but I, but suffice it to say that women and especially, you know, women of color um, have been negatively impacted by the, by the pandemic. So I, I think women are are under an incredible amount of of stress, and already we were under under stress of feeling like we had to work, you know, two times or three times harder um, to have our voice heard or to earn a seat at the table. Um, so yeah, that that in itself is naturally naturally stressful. Um, but then you know you you overlay uh, the pandemic and that. Um, you know, frankly, women today are are working double shifts, non-paid <laughs> um, mm-hmm. work in the household, uh, like childcare uh, or elderly care, elder care or um, domestic. You know, you know, taking care of the household and and everything that that comes under that umbrella is still falling on women. And so compounded with the stress of the job, the job of being the only woman at the table and this feeling of, you know, you have to be perfect and you have to work harder and that, you know, your job is at risk. And it, unless you, you know, are, and, and so how do you balance, you know, having kids at home and having to homeschool and having to take care of the house and also perform more? And I think when you say they need to address it, this is where I would say, you know, leaders are born in times of crises and leaders that can address it quickly, but authentically, because especially if you have a male leader and they're trying to connect or, or convey empathy, do they understand your situation? But yet, you know, they, they don't. And so what does that do? That exasperates the mental health. You know, somebody trying to tell you they get it and things are going to be okay. And you know that they have no clue and, and you're managing three kids homeschooling and carrying a, you know, managing a territory. So I think it's, as you said, it's incumbent upon companies, especially now, if they want to retain their female sales force to really lean into that vulnerability and demonstrate, you know, the empathy and, and show them that they trust. And in saying that you can trust me is just, it, you have to show it, right? And especially now when, when they run the risk of, le- of losing an amazing talent force because women are so stretched right now. And a lot of them, is, you know, I would say they, they, some of them put it on themselves and I can, you know, attest to that. Uh, we, we try to, you know, do everything. And, and I think also the leadership of the company stands behind, you know, we don't expect perfection because we don't know it. We know it doesn't exist. So how can we redefine the normal conditions right now to support each other 
that allows everybody to have a flexible schedule and to say, you know, Heidi, what works for you? I, I know, you know, from nine to 11, you're not available. So, you know, maybe we have a call at three, but I think just having that open communication and setting expectations would just put your team at ease, especially the women on the team and, and allow, okay, well, we can work this out now. And it just shows we can get through this, but we have to make some concessions. Yeah. I, and I think the constructs have to change. You know, you need to look at, um, you know, hybrid work models. You need to look at job sharing. You need to look at, I mean, there's so many different things and, and I'll be really interested to follow uh, the, you know, the, the new ways that companies are going to reinvent themselves to be able to, to address this now and, and post COVID because even when COVID ends, I don't think the world is ever going to go back to the way it was, right? I mean, we're, we're not going to go back mm -hmm. and, and companies are being forced to think about the ways that they structure the workplace so that they can attract talent. And the one, and the other thing I will say, Karen, is, you know, I'm dealing, I'm working with a lot of, you know, college students and, and, you know, the youth, the youth are our future. So not only is it going to impact, you know, companies losing phenomenal talent, but our, the millennial generation, um, the, you know, the Gen Zers that are coming up the pipeline, they are watching and they are voting with their wallets and they have very specific expectations around diversity and inclusion and um, flexibility and and they are going to make decisions about the comp they're the future workforce of America and the way companies handle this today um, is going to be how they succeed in the future because and and the kinds of talent that they're going to be attract and every company right now is fighting for uh, great talent and um, mm -hmm. And, and, and this younger generation is going to make, make decisions on where they want to work, how they want to work based on the way companies react and respond to this, this crisis. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that Gen Z, they're dictating the pace. Um, this is all they know, right? They're, they're in the tech environment, but they're also, they, they have a sense of purpose and belief and they want to be part of something bigger than them. And I think if companies are not willing to do that, as you mentioned, they're, they're going to lose out on the talent because that's, that's what they're, they're wanting. And if you're not responding, you're not going to get the talent, right? And you're going to lose. I agree. hundred percent. Now you mentioned getting your seat at the table and, you know, um, I read the book lean in years ago, but you just think, you know, in your opinion, why are women not taking a seat at the table? Like what's holding them back? Is it a combination of imposter syndrome? Is it lack of belief? Is it, you know, the environment around them? Like what, what do you think it is? Or maybe it's a combination of things. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. I, you know, one, I just think, it's, op, you know, overall opportunities <laughs> that are available and presented. So there's, you know, there's only a certain number of seats at the table. And, and so, you know, you know, competing for those, for those opportunities um, can, you know, can be, be challenging. Uh, I think that, and, and, and women are generally just one up, right? Like, and, and just because of the overall numbers, I mean, when you think about the dynamics, you know, when there's a, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but if there's a five to one ratio um, of men to women in a company already, I don't know, even know if that's real number, but I'm just saying that as an example, then there's only, there's a few, fewer pool of women that could actually qualify for that job. So that's already a problem. That's already problematic, mm -hmm. right? Um, the other thing is, is I, I do believe it's a, you know, women are not applying. Uh, and I, I think that's an issue. I think that uh, confidence is an issue. I, I hear, we talk a lot. I've had a lot of conversations around imposter syndrome and, 
um, thinking, you know, I'm not enough or I'm not good enough or I don't have the skills. So these limiting beliefs, these these uh, voices in our then our these self-limiting beliefs, these voices in our head that uh, prohibit us from feeling that we're qualified or that we're able that we're going to be able to do the job and do the job successfully um, is is an issue. And then you know I think there's other things like training and you know uh, other things. But at the end of the day, the 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 pool is still smaller. <laughs> of of women that can potentially apply mm-hmm. to begin with. It does. And I think it's the chicken and the egg until you can, you know, increase that level of women at the top, that's what's going to drive the next generation coming in. Right. So I feel that that top, that top level needs to increase so that they can attract more women and just kind of bla- blaze the trail for them. But also what you said about, you know, imposter syndrome, uh, the limiting beliefs, and even if you're an existing employee, this is where I feel like a mentorship program would really support this or some form of coaching. Um, and I do a lot of, of sales coaching now, and a lot of it is mindset. And it's as soon as you can get past that limiting belief, you're so effective. Like we are holding ourselves back. And sometimes it's just somebody holding space for you, whether it's a manager, a mentor, somebody, you know, a trusted colleague that can just, you can have a sounding board Um, because I think now, especially with working at home, you know, doing homeschooling, just juggling so many things, it's hard to just turn down the volume of whether it's your negative talk or what's going on around you to get quiet and actually say like, what is going on here? Because I can't even think straight to focus, to start thinking about what my strategic plan is to lean in or to do all these initiatives. So I think if you, if you just, you know, had someone to talk to or a mentorship and, and this is where, you know, and it sounds like you're doing a lot of that. And I do that as well, just giving back. And because sometimes it's the smallest tweak and then they're, they're off to the races, but they just needed that, that slowing down, um, a trusted voice to listen to them. And, and just as you know, they're, they're doing for everybody else, but just to be heard for, for half a second, you know, for themselves. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of mentorship and sponsorship, and I see them as two different things. Uh, you know, I think every woman in every organization should identify a sponsor uh, for them themselves, um, as they move, you know, make their way uh, and progress up the um, the leadership ladder, I think that's really important. But I think I think a mentor is 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 equally as important. And I I I think you just need to find your tribe, right? I think you know women need to to support women, um, and you need to find the people in your life who are willing to listen, that are equally committed, you know, as committed to your success as, as, as you are, and then are willing to, to call you on your stuff. It's, you know, when you have that negative self-talk saying, you know, saying, okay, you know, you can, uh, you know, you can do that for today. um, But tomorrow, you know, you need to shift your mindset and, and be positive because you're phenomenal and you're qualified and, you know, so, so stop, right. The people you're trusted, you know, your trusted advisors and your tribe in your life is incredibly, incredibly important. And uh, yeah. And find people that you trust. That's, I think that's yeah. really, that, that's really important. Yeah, I I think so too. I think a community of just, uh, as you mentioned, a safe space where you can all share, but also somebody to hold you accountable. You know, and I think sometimes it's like you need the, sometimes you need a hug and sometimes you need a kick and, and who's that person that's going to do it and where you trust them, you know, and they know you in a loving way, (laughs) but it's like, okay, I'll let you, you know, grovel in your self pity today. Um, but tomorrow's a new day and, you know, and hold you, yeah, hold you accountable and, and call you out in a, in a loving, in a loving, supportive way. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's important. Yeah. Uh, Well, Heidi, we've covered a lot of ground here. So thank you for all the insights. Um, 
and, and just hopefully we can see that companies are going to start adopting, you know, the, change their language from when they're attracting talent, even once the talent's there, you can't just, you know, forget about it. We want to retain these people and, and make them feel that, you know, they're not just a survey or not just a box checked and, and their actions at that leadership level are congruent with the mission and the movement they're trying to create. Because I think if it's not, then you're not going to hold on to that talent um, long term. Um, so if, if there's someone, you know, wanting to get into sales, a young girl, and she's just kind of on the fence and she's kind of questioning, is it for me? And I'm not sure I'm going to be well suited for this. Like, how, what, what advice would you give her? And maybe, you know, what three things could she start doing to prepare herself to get into a sales role? Well, of course, I'll do a plug, you know, for our hashtag uh, sales by choice program, which we're rolling out, which is all about uh, educating you know, young women about what sales is, what sales isn't, and and giving them the opportunity to learn more about the opportunities so that they can make a educated and informed decision of whether sales is is right for them at, at, or or not. So that's you know the one that's what our mission is, right? Is is to do that. But I think that I think it, it is important to educate yourself. So uh, you know, read books, read articles. I'm, you know, I'm an avid reader. Uh, I think it's important to, to learn, um, about, about sales, if it's something that you're interested in. So pull some resources. Uh, and, but then I think, and it ties into our mentorship discussion, you know, join organizations, uh, that are sales, uh, that are sales focused. Uh, the National Organization for Female, uh, for Women Sales Executive is, is really great. Um, there's a lot of different organizations or just talk to other women, you know, who are in sales. And I will tell you that it's a very generous, very given community. And we, women in general do want to, uh, to see and support other women in sales. And so they're very open to uh, speaking with you and talking to you. So reach out uh, to other sales leaders. And I think, you know, people think that they are not going to help or that you're wasting their time, but people, including me, genuinely want to help. And, and, you know, having been in their situation and done it before, like there's so many lessons that we can share, you know, and, and guide them a little bit and still allow them to, you know, make some mistakes, but you know, if we can shift them a little bit and just put them in the right direction, as you've shared with mentorship programs, uh, reading books, listening to podcasts, educating yourself to allow yourself to make the best decision for you. I think just, you know, ask people are going to, people are going to help you. They're willing, they want to help. Yeah. And I, th I think that, uh, you know, learning about it. And if you decide that it's a career you want to pursue, awesome, right? Like that's great. And then go, and get some training and um there's a lot of great programs out there i mean um you know we're one of the only that are really focused on on early um career uh talent but i think you know there there is a lot of good um uh, you know resources out there for you but on the other hand you know it even if you if you decide that sales a traditional b2b sales is not for you that's fine too right like i think it is important to to mm -hmm. learn about and decide what it, you know what you don't want it's as important to know what you don't want as it is to decide what you do want uh to mm -hmm. pursue from a career perspective in your life and uh, the one thing i can guarantee is regardless of whether you uh pursue a career in sales and uh, or not uh, sales is a skill that you will use throughout your life, whether it's, you know, interviewing or trying to sell a proposal or a concept or an idea or trying to negotiate with your children um, to do certain things. Sales is definitely a, mm -hmm. um, a super important uh, critical skill to learn. Yeah. We're all always selling. Some of us just are unaware of it. So I think uh, we need to be mindful of that. Um, well, thank you again, Heidi, for sharing all your insights, the data, um, what it takes for companies to really uh, lean into the diversity and inclusivity 
And um, hopefully we'll continue to see this needle move and um, things turn around um, post pandemic. So again, thank you for your time. If anyone would like to learn a little bit more about girls who sell or get in touch with you and follow you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, so you can learn more about girls who sell at www.girlswhosell.com. And that's G I R L Z who sell.com. And, um, I'm pretty accessible. So you can reach out to me through the website and, or you can uh, go onto our Facebook page. You can um, go on to LinkedIn if you happen to be on the LinkedIn. And I am all about supporting and mentoring other women. And so please reach out and um, I'm happy to answer any questions or help in any way. That's great. Thank you, Heidi. We'll include all those details in the show notes. So again, thank you uh, for sharing your wisdom and your expertise with us today. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you so much.